My name is Anna Clayton. I'm a physio at Perry Physio Clinic um, and I've been qualified for about 17 years and as of 2020 um, became one of the directors in the clinic. Um, I'm predominantly musculoskeletal physio and completed my master's back in 2016 um, but also do some work with oncology, cancer rehab patients um, and more recently over the last six years or so um, women's health primarily because um, the physios that used to run the service left and so I picked up the baton to carry on. Um, I am an ex-PACES member, so some of you may know me, um, so I'm not, but I do support you in spirit, um, even if I don't do your um, races and events. Um, and in my spare time, I run, cycle, swim, dabble in a bit of triathlon, um, and do a weekly body pump class um, with Hazel, who's also on this call. Um, so it's designed really for anyone who um, participates in sport be a physio PT um, and I've been doing a hormone course um, with another women's health physio called Michelle Lyons who's a bit of a guru with all things women's health um, and it covers topics from um, menstrual years, um, perinatal, postnatal, perimenopause and postmenopause um, which is what we're going to cover today and also um, add in some bits and bobs about Red S as well, which is a little bit more applicable to um, running, endurance sport, um, but we'll cover that shortly. Um, the session is recorded, so we are going to be starting up, um, hopefully, a Berry Physio podcast, um, and this will be recorded uh, and uploaded onto the YouTube channel, um, which is on our clinic website as well. All the details will be at the end um, of the, the presentation. Um, for some of the images in the presentation, I have um, asked permissions for them from Michelle Lyons and also from um, a lady called Kirsty Elliott Sale, who is a researcher in public health at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and there's some quite good um, papers that she's produced. Um, one of the tables at the end uh, is a little bit more applicable to coaches uh, in terms of the considerations for female athletes as well so I'll, I'll give you the links um if you want to have a look um and there's also some quite good resources for women's health podcasts um at your cervix is one that I've listened to quite a lot um and again the details will be at the end um so although a lot of this refers to athletes um it does include those who exercise for fitness um, you don't have to be an athlete, um, although a lot of women's health studies do focus on this particular population. Um, in our own ways, we're all athletes, really, depending on whether you're grassroots or elite. Um, at the end, we're also going to have some additional information um, from Emma Robinson, who is also on call. Um, Emma has a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and a Master of Science in Nutritional Therapy, and we'll be talking about nutrition and lifestyle tips hormonal balance so there's a little bit of overlap with some of the things that we'll cover um, at the end um i've popped on both our email addresses um we very much value your feedback uh, if you wouldn't mind emailing um and also if you have any um suggestions for future topics of um talks quite happy to put some sessions together i mean most of these topics we cover menstrual health postnatal perimenopause or you could do an entire talk um on them in in one an evening anyway so um it's a bit of a whistle stop tour but if you've got particular areas you'd like um more information on um let me know and i will do some homework so on to the next slide um generally women's bodies change throughout our life stages really um and having a good understanding of hormone change is really quite important but more essentially what is normal for you as an individual and maybe how that changes through your your lifespan um it's quite good to have an understanding of of menstrual health hormonal health really for um symptom management and knowing when things are changing 
Um, so that really applies more to, to women perhaps who aren't on um, birth control or contraceptive um, pills, um, who do have regular cycles, which we'll, we'll come to. Um, as you then get closer to perimenopause, um, it can be easier to know whether things are starting to, to change. Um, but as you can see on the slides, the hormones that we're going to cover really are um, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. Um, the menstrual cycle will come on into the next slide. Um, but the reason it's quite a focus on it is because um, back in 2015, um, ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, classified it as the fifth vital sign to health, women's health particularly, um, along with heart rate, temperature, breathing or respiration rate and oxygen saturations. Um, again, looking at exposing the, the female body to normal monthly hormonal fluctuations and if those start to change, again if they're not controlled through um, hormonal contraception, um, then having an awareness of any any changes um, is quite key um, so it's really quite important to understand menstrual health for women and men really um, and to be aware of what your normal is so there's a lot of talk in research of n equals one um, which is really um, knowing what is your norms for your own body um, and looking at any changes um, We'll also, you know, look at some postnatal changes to the body and touch on some phased return to activity and exercise. Um, also be aware of changes in perimenopause, so the winding down, if you like, of um, fertility and function. And then postmenopause, when you have a, a steadier drop in hormone levels, possibly with some symptoms from peri perimenopause. Um, but all of these really are looking at living well throughout the phases in our lives and then beyond into ageing. So for the women on the call, if you're not on contraception, track your periods. Um, it's quite a sort of um, focal point that will run through the talk, probably. Um, really to know what your normals are. We'll, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about... Um, durations of menstrual cycles and how they vary um, but you can use you know lots of apps free apps the balance app you can use a calendar you can write it down um, and just get a, a sort of pattern of what your your normal sort of cycle duration is and then also monitoring any symptoms premenstrual stuff as well um, so understand what hormones do for us females and how to look after them is what we are going to talk about um for any physios or pts personal trainers in the talk or maybe coaches something to ponder if you're not already doing so do you ask female athletes about their periods um there's a lot of um pelvic health um issues um endometriosis polycystic ovaries and things like that that can present as musculoskeletal issues hip pain back pain groin pain uh, abdominal pain and so sometimes on differential diagnosis or um, trying to understand what the source of symptoms are um, it might actually be something that's more women's health related as opposed to a mechanical back pain for example so it's always quite useful to get some additional information about symptoms um, relating to pelvic health hormones and if there is any sort of lower back hip pain for example um, for coaches it can also give an indication of training and injury issues which is something we'll come on to with the red s section as well so we'll, we'll come back to that what do hormones do uh, some of you may know some of you we've got a bit of a recap so estrogen um on the left side of the slide is um one of the main female sex hormones and um it's pretty incredible it has about 400 functions in the body um which is slightly unfortunate given that it starts to decline as we age because it has quite a lot of influence on a lot of our body functions um it's an anabolic um chemical i guess so it actually promotes muscle growth but it can make tendons less stiff so when you're looking at your menstrual cycle peaks in estrogen when you come up to ovulation 
Um, being aware of this, uh, if you're an athlete yourself and training, um, you know, you might find there's a little bit more risk of injury risk, uh, risk of injury. Um, if sort of rest recovery training isn't balanced, um, and estrogen is also an has an anti-inflammatory function as well. It has an effect on quite a lot of structures in our body. So you've got muscles, tendons, bones and bone health, ligaments, heart health with the endothelial cells, which are your heart cells. Um, and estrogen is very cardioprotective. Um, so when we come on to the menopause section, um, we'll touch a little bit on, on risks of lower estrogen and heart health issues. Um, it's brain protective, so brain health. Um, digestive issues it, it has functions with um, sexual health mood and for women's health specific um, things it, it also has um, some influence on bladder so stress urinary incontinence which is predominantly a postnatal consideration but not solely um, often postnatally um, bladder leakage is common but it's not a normal thing to have to endure for the months after birth um stress urine incontinence is where there's often leakage on high pressure increased intra-abdominal or middle trunk pressure coughing sneezing jumping on a trampoline for example um, and the urge incontinence is the urgency to get to the toilet um often referred to as like the front door key syndrome you're you kind of needed a wee, and then you really, really needed a wee when you got to the door. Um, and then also um, bowel and pelvic pain. Uh, estrogen has some influence on progesterone. Um, its sort of function is given away by the name a little bit. So progest, it basically wants to prep the body for pregnancy. Um, but it does have a function to keep estrogen in check. Um, so too much estrogen is not good, uh, but... Um, you can think of the sort of hormone balance with estrogen and progesterone as like estrogen is like grass growing in the summer, grows a lot, and then progesterone is like your lawnmower. So it will, will keep tabs on, on the balance through the cycle, which we'll cover in a tick. Um, progesterone is also produced by the corpus luteum um, in the second phase of the menstrual cycle, um, which I'm going to come to shortly. Not to forget testosterone. Um, it's produced in the ovaries and the adrenal glands and it's released into the bloodstream um, it has a good function it maintains bone mass and is also important for brain function and muscle health as well it can help generate new blood cells um, and also maintains uh, libido vaginal health and regulates mood um, women typically can't get too buff with the amount of testosterone that we have we only have about a tenth of the level of testosterone compared with men so if you're doing strength training it's physiologically impossible to end up looking like the michelin man um, unless you're on some sort of substance so getting a good balance of those hormones is quite um quite key there are also some diet considerations um with sex hormone production um Again, we'll touch a little bit of that in um, the red S section and Emma will probably also cover some bits at the end. Um, we need healthy fats in our diets to help produce sex hormones as well. Um, cholesterol tends to get a bit of a bad rap in the press, but it's actually quite essential in our diets um, for this function. Um, so if there are elements of restrictive food intake or overtraining, then... Um, these sorts of foods are not necessarily taken on um, and that can also influence the production of the sex hormones. So on we go to the menstrual cycle. So again, these are from uh, these images from um, the Kirsty Elliott Sale 2019 paper, which is called Considerations for Coaches Training Female Athletes um, and also the chart near the end um is also from there it's a little bit small on the screen um but quite interesting to look at what kind of exercise um is perhaps slightly more um sort of beneficial to the body at certain points in the menstrual cycle 
So the uh, menstrual cycle typically varies in duration from female to female. Um, and also sometimes for a female, if, you know, the stress um, life events and things that can sometimes alter it a little. But normally somewhere between 21 and 35 days. Um, and that generally applies to women not on contraception. Um, and there's four phases. We also have a sort of uterine and an ovarian cycle, which sort of run hand in hand, really. Um, so if you're looking at the menstrual or menstruation phase, phase one, um, the cycle starts really on the first day that you get fresh red blood when your period starts. And that normally, again, lasts for about five to seven days. And this is when estrogen levels and progesterone levels are quite low. Uh, you then move into the follicular phase, which is technically the first half of the cycle, and that's roughly 11 days long. Um, estrogen starts to rise, uh, so you often feel quite good, like you want to conquer the world, for example. Um, and the pituitary gland triggers a release of um, FSH, which is follicle-stimulating hormone. Testosterone also increases a little bit here as well. And so when you're looking at, uh, I mentioned the table at the end of um, Kirsty's research paper, um, type of exercise you might want to do in certain phases of the cycle. Um, strength training is quite good in this in this phase. Um, tendons love estrogen, and obviously that's starting to increase. Um, also, you might find that athletic performance in, increases. You might get a PB or a strength training uh, record on a, on a lift, for example. Um, in this phase, there's also sort of increased endurance, pain tolerance and also insulin uh, sensitivity. Um, and there's some evidence that carb, carbohydrate uh, metabolism, metabolism is also better um, in this phase as well. Then we come on to ovulation. So the big peak in the middle of the graph, can't miss it. Um, and it's not always on day 14 of your cycle. There's a lot of um, information online um, that typically classify the cycle as being you know 28 days long on ovulation is day 14 it's absolutely rubbish um so that's why tracking cycles is quite important because it gives you an idea um if you're not sure there are these apps that you can use but typically from a, a physical perspective when you're at peak ovulation which is maybe three or four days um the your temperature is a little bit higher in the morning and also your cervical mucus is much thinner like egg yolk um so that can give you an idea of when you're actually at peak of ovulation um during this phase luteinizing hormone or lh is released and that stimulates a follicle to re re release a mature egg so after that um, egg is released that leftover follicle then transforms into the corpus luteum and that actually acts as a temporary endocrine gland so a hormone gland and that's where you get some of your progesterone production from um, as you then come into your luteal phase um, which is the second half and the last part of the cycle so that's roughly 11 to 17 days long estrogen is declining so the corpus luteum pumps out your progesterone which is it does for about 12 to 14 days um, basically your progesterone is prepping for a possible pregnancy um so if there is no fertilization your corpus luteum stops your progesterone production and dies after about two weeks 14 days and then your uterus lining sheds and you get your period and the cycle starts again so again if you're looking at your exercise preferences you might find that um, cardio exercise is preferable um fat oxidation is slightly better in this phase as well and because of the increase in progesterone and that preparation for pregnancy, um, often women get the munchies um, and your appetite increases. So that's why that can sometimes have that ebb and flow through the cycle. Again, if you're not on hormonal um, contraception. Premenstrual symptoms, um, again, can be fairly vast, um, but typically might be um, bloating, mood changes, diarrhea, cramps those are typically caused by your prostaglandins um, which are the same chemicals that your body produces in labor slightly less intensely though as i am led to believe um, and that's what causes the uterus lining to shed 
so it gives these like mini contractions through the uterus which is where the cramps come from um in this phase you might want to monitor bowel changes or you might notice bowel changes um so there might be some diet mod modification to to happen um so establishing any triggers um at that kind of premenstrual phase like spicy food or fruit um can actually be quite useful um it, it's often known as the, the period squits um i mean there are other words but i probably can't say them on here um where basically because the prostaglandins are so close to your bowel and it's clearing out the contents of your uterus it will also clear out the contents of your bowel as well so dietary wise you might want to find some foods that that don't go straight through you um interestingly your per your premenstrual symptoms can give you a little bit of an insight into some of the perimenopausal symptoms that you might experience um later in life if you are not yet 35 years old or over i'll come on to that shortly um a side note though for periods um painful periods are not normal so do you get sort of pain associated with per uh, periods investigated one in 10 women will experience endometriosis um and often that can take quite some time to diagnose as well so if periods are affecting school or work um you get bladder pain pain during sex irregular light or very heavy bleeding um chronic yeast infections uh abdominal or pelvic pain ibs bloating gas or constipation that's much greater than it would be at other points in your cycle um then do get that looked at either through your gp or a gynae specialist so it comes back really to tracking your cycles know what is normal for you um use diaries apps uh, and monitor any significant changes as well <laughs> 